take you to some uncharted territories where both we haven't been and it's changing. And the more we can understand now, we'll maybe get a little handle on what might happen in the future. And I want to start by just telling you that I, I vividly remember the first time I actually slept on a glacier. I was climbing Mount Rainier, fresh out of college. This was before glaciers and climate change were a cocktail party conversation. And the climb was great. The view from the summit was beautiful. But the, my favorite part was definitely sleeping on the glacier because when we all quieted down, when everybody, all the tents got quiet and we laid down just lying on that glacier, you can actually feel it and hear it just thundering and cracking underneath me. Um, and this was when I really realized that ice really is alive. It's the stuff that it flows on our landscape. It moves subtly through the landscape. Sometimes, um, sometimes you'll get a big calving event or something, but most of the time it's this subtle movement across our landscape as it creeps through valleys down mountains. And that was what really inspired me to look into this further. I really wanted to understand what was going on with the glaciers. I've learned as much about myself and about the way we go about observing the world as I have about the ice itself. And that's because of that subtlety. This, this subtle movement on the landscape, the, the changes that are happening, sometimes changes you might, if you're lucky, you can see a change in a glacier in a day. It's pretty hard even to see changes in glaciers over the course of a year. And sometimes it's even hard to see changes in some places over the course of your lifetime. So this subtle, these subtle changes, this subtle movement on our landscape that's actually quite important um, has made me think about how we really need to be careful observationists. We need to be creative about how we approach observing these landscapes in order to really understand the behavior of these glaciers. So why does the ice matter? You guys have probably heard little bits from all different aspects. Um, it is beautiful, it's stunning, it's a very emotional landscape to be in when you're surrounded by it, as this painting by my friend Maria shows. Um, but it does impact all of us. So the melting ice that's going on every day now, that's been melting quite a bit over the last century, and that is causing sea level rise everywhere. And it might seem like a little bit of sea level rise when you hear it in terms of numbers, but a little bit of sea level rise actually does change the wave action and the way storms hit any coast. You get er more erosion, you get um, just all sorts of changes, weird deposition and, and erosion along the landscapes and along the coastlines. You get farmlands being inundated by salt water. This is happening and it's affecting everything from New York to Bangladesh. And little bit, a little bit does have a big impact. But the other reason that ice matters is that there are actually a lot of local effects. There are people in Norway and Iceland, for example, that use hydropower from glaciers. There's water resources around the world. Many places around the world come from glaciers. So Peru, the Himalaya, um, Norway, Alaska. There's communities all over the world that really rely on the glaciers to provide their water resources. But the ecosystem themselves also need those water resources. There are salmon that need that cold water coming in the middle of summer to give them the river that's more comfortable that they want to swim up. If they just have the water that's been heated by the sun all summer, then that's a much more challenging environment for them. So the whole downstream ecosystem really relies on the amount and the timing of the water that comes down from the glaciers. The same is true where the glaciers hit the ocean. The glaciers affect the salinity of the water in the fjords. It affects the circulation of the water in the fjords. It gives seals places to get up out of the water so they can avoid their predators and relax for a while. So the ice, although it's not nearby us all the time, it actually does affect us in many different ways. But I'm going to talk a bit more today about Antarctica. Antarctica is really interesting because here it's cold enough down here that ice on land is flowing off the continent. And when it hits the water, it actually doesn't immediately break up or melt and float away. 
So the ice on the land in Antarctica and many places around the continent flows down off and turns into floating ice shelves. These ice shelves are hundreds to a thousand meters thick of ice floating on the ocean surface. This is much different than sea ice, which is a few meters, a few meters thick of frozen seawater. These ice shelves are pretty critical. They surround all of Antarctica, all along the edges. They're actually critical for moderating the amount of ice that flows off the continent and into the ocean. And it's that moderation role that it plays that means that these ice shelves are what are kind of holding the dam back on allowing parts of Antarctica to really flood and create and generate sea level rise. The Antarctic Peninsula is where most of the action is happening right now. In the last 50 years, our estimates are that the temperatures in the Antarctic Peninsula are increasing five times faster than the global average temperature is changing. There's some stations in the peninsula that are, that are changing 10 times faster than the global average temperature has been changing for the last 50 years. So there's been a lot of warming there and a lot of changes. And in that time, in just the last couple decades, we've had eight ice shelves around the peninsula disintegrate into nothing. And the glaciers that fed those ice shelves are now moving faster, the ice is thinning, and that ice is going straight into the ocean and, and contributing to sea level rise. The largest of these events happened in 2002 and made national news, international news. The Larsen B ice shelf disintegrated in a matter of a couple of weeks. The Larsen B ice shelf is an area the size of Rhode Island. And the picture on your left was taken in, on January 31st, and the picture on the right was taken on March 5th. And most of the actual action happened a couple of weeks before March 5th. There was nobody on the ground to see this. There were no instruments installed to get here because this is a really difficult part of Antarctica to get to. Um, even though just on the other side of the peninsula is where a lot of the cruise ships do go. But getting to this side, this eastern side of the peninsula, is quite a bit harder. So there's no, there, there are no instruments there. So that means that in the last since then, we've sort of said, you know what, we need to get on the ground and see what's going on there and be ready to under, try to understand what happened here and also be ready for when the next, the next ice shelf goes. So this um, got a lot of us, a number of, we, I'm working now with about 15 different scientists from all different fields. We have biologists, um, ecologists, marine geologists, uh, oceanographers, atmospheric sciences, glaciologists, we've all gotten together for this NSF-funded project. It's called the Larissa Project, where we've taken over, this is the Nathaniel B. Palmer research vessel, and we've, National Geographic has played a role in this, in this project as well. We've been down there a couple of times, trying to get in there, trying to get some instruments on the ground to make some measurements to understand what has happened since that ice shelf disintegrated. Because we went from an ocean bay that had ice cover, no sunlight, for thousands of years, and suddenly we've now uncovered it, and there's, uh, there's photosynthesis able to happen, and organisms are moving in. The entire ecosystem is changing. The ocean circulation are changing. The tidal structure is changing there. Um, the glaciers here have, have definitely accelerated. And our best estimate right now is that over the last 10 years since this happened, it's um, contributed about a quarter of a millimeter of sea level rise globally. But that's just, this is just one event, and it, that's only what it's done so far. The glaciers are still accelerating, still contributing to sea level rise. So some of, a lot of these processes are actually normal for glaciers. They calve, they, they, they melt. But the problem is, when, what is it that triggers them to go through this runaway process and completely disintegrate and cause these bigger issues? In this case, we think it was mostly atmospheric warming with a little bit of ocean warming that gradually thinned this ice shelf until it was just teetering on the edge. And then one warm summer in 2002 caused it to just break apart into a million pieces. But not all ice shelves work exactly like that. The trick here is that we need to figure out how to ask the right questions in order to get these answers. It's a really difficult environment to work in. Glaciers, conceptually, I should say, it is physically as well, but glaciers have processes happening from millimeter scale to tens of kilometer scale. They also have processes going on on the, on the scale of seconds to the scale of hundreds of thousands of years. 
And being able to capture all of that and these processes are interacting on all of these scales, you can't just ignore one scale and focus only on the other. So it's this, this process of trying to understand, trying to make these observations that got me thinking, trying to think a little bit outside of the box, well, a lot outside of the box, but being creative. And in doing that, I've looked for a lot of help from a lot of people and things, and in this case, a whale. This is at the um, McBride Glacier in Alaska, where I had the experience one night of camping on a spit here, and all night long, the glacier was calving, and a whale would respond to that calving event by breaching out on the other side. So all night long, we had a glacier calve, a whale breached. The glacier calved, the whale breached. It was a pretty profound experience for me, and I started thinking about what the whale actually hears under the water. So I went and recorded it. So you're going to hear a calving event here in a minute. And what I'd like you to get out of that is that there's stuff happening at all frequencies. Did you hear the rumble that started it all before? the actual calving event, and then we have this higher frequency stuff going on at the end. This is information that we don't get from listening in the air with our ears. We have to get under the water and really see it as the whale hears it. So looking at the whole system from a different perspective, really like thinking, what, what other ways can we see this system? Looking, just forgetting what I've known about systems before, and just looking at that new perspective, I think is a really important part of just approaching any of these systems, um, any of the landscape that we have, any of our environment and exploring. And the girls on Girls on Ice have really taught me that a lot. They come from inner city New York. They come from San Diego. They come from rural Kansas. They come without preconceived notions of what this mountain environment is supposed to give them. And they've helped me see the way that the colors on the inside of a crevasse can actually be really interesting and useful in ways that I hadn't thought of them. They've just helped me see that we can look at the, this landscape from so many different perspectives. And it's when we allow ourselves to really look at it from those different perspectives that we learn so much. So in the end, I really wanted to just share with you some of the things that ice has taught me. Um, I've also worked with artists out on the ice, and that's been really fun because they've taught me things like you have to turn the world upside down to really see it for what it is. They've also taught me that if you squint, you can kind of get rid of all of the detail and you can see the big picture a lot more easily. So it's been really fun working with all of these people um, and seeing the different perspectives that the whale gives me, that the artists gives me, that the girls give me, that other scientists working with oceanographers, biologists, that everybody has given me. And kind of to bring it all together, I've realized that the best discoveries that we make in life really come when we step out of our comfort zone. And I think that's one of the things that all of these explorers that I've met this week have been able to do. That whether that's your physical comfort zone, where you do spend a week sitting in a blind waiting for the tiger and getting frustrated and tired, um, or your intellectual comfort zone, where you are allowed to let go of what you were taught in high school or middle school and really see the environment or the data from a new perspective. And there's also your social or leadership comfort zone, where, you know, like me, pretty shy and quiet growing up. And it's taken a lot to really push outside of that comfort zone and step up and talk in front of 400 people. <laughs> so, so I just want to leave you with that thought. I think what we all can do is think about when and where and how can we step out of our comfort zones and start to see the world from a different perspective. Thank you. <laughs>